Welcome, everyone. Welcome to all of our uh, Arizona colleagues. Thanks again for uh, joining us for this, as, as Jim said, the last uh, of the five webinar webinars in the series for our Arizona community of practice. And so we've, we've come a long way and hopefully this will webinar will help integrate um, some of the other uh, webinars that we've had along the way as well. And so really our, our uh, purpose today is to, again, talk about uh, nicotine uh, free policies. Um, we would have formally, if we were doing this webinar, we would have really referred to the, this uh, presentation as a tobacco free policy uh, webinar, but we're highly recommending uh, that any policy includes any form of nicotine use, including electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS, uh, heat not, you know, the heat not burn devices that are now coming on the market and all the many, many products that I'm sure have yet to be developed and will be marketed by Big Tobacco and other, com other uh, companies in the coming year. And so we really wanna get ahead of that and uh, as, as far as policy is concerned and try to address these all forms of uh, nicotine use to the degree possible as we, as we move along. And so in this presentation, we're gonna outline the evidence-based steps towards taking a organization nicotine free, uh, whether this is a community-based or outpatient or institutional setting. So the steps really apply across a wide swath of different uh, treatment settings or public health settings or, or community settings. And, and we're going to spend some time discussing the expected challenges uh, in putting a policy together and implementing and sustaining a, a policy as well as uh, proven solutions to those challenges. And along the way through these slide sets, we'll, we'll do our best to share some tested resources, which we're, we're hopeful that you can utilize uh, yourselves, but then also we very much welcome you to uh, disseminate uh, these resources to your state and county partners uh, to use as well as we move along. So, you know, I like to start by just talking a little bit about creating healthy habits, and this will, will set the stage for uh, the steps towards going uh, nicotine free or, and, and creating those policies. Uh, habits at an individual level are really difficult to change, um, particularly uh, tobacco cessation or nicotine cessation is one of the most difficult habits to break. And we've spent some time talking about that. And this is due to a variety of factors, but um, these products are very embedded in our culture and our history. Um, they're highly marketed, um, they're legal. Uh, they obviously have a, a very heavy physical addiction component um, in comparison to other drugs. Uh, possibly they are uh, one of the most addictive substance, substances out there. Uh, there's perceived psychological benefits, and I like to emphasize that word perceived. And then there's all the social elements that go around with, with smoking uh, and, and using other uh, nicotine products that really lead these to be uh, difficult to give up. And so this is a very simplistic model that you're seeing uh, in front of you. Uh, the fact that we're surrounded by external and internal cues that maintain a routine in our lives that lead to some kind of imminent and typically immediate uh, reward that really reinforces any kind of habit, whether it's healthy or undesired or unhealthy. Um, and it's really uh, the, the, the point that I'm trying to make with this figure though, is that it is very critical that the environment is shaped to support desired behavior change. Asking someone to quit smoking or vaping in a setting in which nicotine addiction is directly or indirectly condoned is akin to asking someone to manage their weight while they're living in a fast food restaurant. Uh, but I think quitting nicotine is probably even more difficult than that. So we really wanna set people up for success and, and one of the ways we can do that best is to create uh, a tobacco-free environment. And just as habits are hard to change at an individual level, they can be even more daunting at an organizational level. 
where you have the history, the culture, the climate of an environment which, with which you have to contend when you're putting new policies or practices into place. So when it comes to helping out the individuals most in need of quitting smoking, the individuals that you are, uh, you know, our colleagues in Arizona are most uh, focused on, whether they're justice involved, they're low income, the low income population, the, there's those that are homeless or imminently at risk at homeless or people with uh, mental health issues or other addictions. Um, they're, they're typically served in environments where, of course, the staff, the clinicians, the correctional officers smoke at very high rates themselves. So this just exacerbates some of the challenges that we face with policy. So from a leadership perspective, the status quo and not rocking the boat is obviously the easier short-term route. Um, even when it's not advantageous in the long term to the health and safety of employees and, and those that we serve in a variety of settings. Um, it's not advantageous long term to community integration and, uh, and it's not advantageous to the organization's bottom line and that can happen very, very quickly as well. But there's a long-term commitment that's necessary initially in telling new skill sets, time, productivity, uh, possible reductions in productivity because we need to focus on this new initiative. Those are just a few of, of the things that people are concerned about. There's under, understandable doubt that, a, a, that accompanies any major shift and specifically, um, will this really work or will this cause chaos? Will staff be dissatisfied? Will we you know, possibly lose some of our staff? Will we lose our client base because that they can't smoke, they're gonna go elsewhere, so we're gonna lose our census. Uh, so change can come at an expense. And uh, from an organizational standpoint, they take, you know, there's really very real competing demands that are faced. And so it's, it's uh, very understandable that leadership, staff, et cetera, are, are questioned when we bring up going nicotine free. As a, as a policy and, and a policy on the campus as a whole. So this is something really that each organization needs to decide for itself if they're ready for this. Uh, but we, And we're gonna go through these step, the steps, but we can confidently state that a successful policy initiative is not only possible, but it's probable if organizations follow a few straightforward steps along the way. And so we're gonna get into those, those very steps. Uh, and, the, and the first thing that um, really needs to happen is that there has to be agency alignment. And so uh, while, while we very much need bottom-up support for policy changes of any kind, um, for, for a nicotine-free uh, environment, it has to be a top-down uh, initiative. There has to be enthusiastic support from the head of the organization, whether it's the CEO, executive director, COO, et cetera. Um, so while these initiatives really necessitate grassroots support, the, over, the overt support of senior leadership, and if there's a board, um, that support from the, uh, the board is, is mandatory. And I really use that word strongly, mandatory. Uh, it's one of the most critical steps. And without this, it's likely that a policy will have difficulties being uh, successfully implemented and maintained. And so uh, as an organization, the leadership really needs to help frame the context of, of the policy. And the first step is really looking at their mission and their core values and looking at how having a nic nicotine-free environment is consistent with that mission and core values. If it's not, then they either need to uh, question that mission and core values and, and make changes, um, but often it is very, if it, it's health related or, or you know, service related from a public uh, health perspective, it's uh, more often than not, the mission is gonna be very consistent with going uh, nicotine free. And then the, really the leadership needs to step two, build a very clear rationale about why they're doing this and tie it to their strategic objectives um, and their strategic plan and look at the return on investment that they, they expect from going tobacco free. And so when I say return on investment, it's not only the monetary return, 
but that's very real. So there could be reduced maintenance and cleaning costs, uh, decreased accidents and fires, decreased health insurance costs, decreased workers' compensation payments from a facility standpoint. Um, the, from the staff and client perspective, their health is gonna get better. So you're gonna see less hospital admissions, um, probably less psychiatric hospital admissions, you're gonna see less absentee, absenteeism. So, and, and you're gonna see less presenteeism. So people showing up but not really being totally present because they're really, you know, as one example, they're really focused on when their next smoke break is gonna happen. And there's a lot of time that's involved with, with, with smoke breaks. And so you can show that ROI pretty quickly over a year or two years um, and the gains in staff productivity and the, the, you know, also the gains in staff satisfaction. So that's what we see time and time again. But along with this, uh, at this really early stage, it's important that leadership and senior leadership communicates what their intentions are and makes it very clear that they intend to go uh, nicotine free and that there's gonna be expectations uh, both on themselves as, as demonstrating leadership, but then also on staff employees, visitors, but then also the client patients and those, those that are being served in whatever environment it is. And so that it will become part of the policy um, drafting that we spend more time talking about as we move along with this presentation. And the nice thing is that um, at BHWP, we, we've had the opportunity, and it really has been a, a privilege, to take uh, approximately 300, 400 agencies and organizations tobacco-free. So the, some of the, in, these initiatives have been statewide mandates, say on the, the uh, behavioral health sector. A lot of times they're single agencies or they're single hospitals, um, but they really run the, the, the full gamut. So they run, again, things like ambul ambulatory care, outpatient, detox, uh, inpatient psych units, uh, jails, prisons, homelessness, uh, homelessness types of service centers. And uh, I can go on and on, but, so, but the point is that across all of those different environments, what we found is that there are um, steps involved no matter what setting you're in. And again, if you walk through those steps, you're gonna be successful in your nicotine-free uh, initiative. And so those are captured in, in the toolkit that we put together. At that time, you, you notice that it's tobacco-free. We really need to update this and say nicotine-free um, policy toolkit. But this is available uh, on, on our website if you haven't already uh, downloaded it. And again, you can feel free to disseminate this in any way that makes uh, sense to you. But the bottom line is that a lot of agencies that are headed in this direction really feel like they need to uh, reinvent policy, reinvent these steps. And there's absolutely no reason why any agency should be reinventing how to go nicotine free at this point in time. There's just too many good examples out there of policies. Uh, templates for uh, reinforcement, messaging, communications, et cetera. So if we, and that's all, we tried to capture a lot of this in this toolkit. And if it's not there, chances are that there's other um, resources out there uh, through the uh, Smoking Cessation Leadership Center and some of the other resources that will kind of end on, on just again, giving those um, a plug for those uh, those websites and those, uh, those programs that have just wonderful resources. But getting into the, the, the steps themselves, so these are the 10 steps. And so we're gonna move through these uh, one at a time and, and, and just spend a little time on, on each. You know, we don't have time to delve into to each one of these very intensively. Um, but, uh, you know, we invite that conversation if you have questions or, or on any of these. Um, so, you know, we're going to talk about how important it is to convene your wellness committee and then create your change plan, draft your policy, communicate that plan, then build community support amongst your partners for that plan, provide education. And when we say that, we're, we're really saying provide education, both 
you know, really for the policy, concentrating internally on your staff, your faculty, um, your providers, but also externally, you know, uh, really educating the community about why this is so important. Off we'll talk about offering tobacco cessation services, actually launching your policy, and then enforcing your policy. We, we get questions about this all the time, and it's, it's really critical. It's one thing to implement a policy, it's another thing to sustain it. And so we spend a lot of time uh, providing consult to groups about sustaining their policy. And then evalu evaluating your program along the way is, is really critical as well. And so let's, let's look at each one of these and really initially focus on convening the wellness committee. So th this, after the, the leadership is bought in, um, they've you know, got the board involved. If there's a, a board that uh, is part of the organization, um, they've talked about mission consistency and st strategic planning consistency, et cetera. Uh, if there's not already a wellness committee that exists, we highly recommend that you create one. Um, this is really essential, and we, we recommend that it's called a wellness committee, not a nicotine-free committee uh, for a variety of reasons, and, and definitely not, at, in this point in time, a tobacco-free committee. Um, but it's a means of gathering a, you know, a group of champions and individuals with strong skill sets um, that are ac across your organization to look at wellness as a whole and really approach this as a whole health um, initiative. And we find that the engagement is much better if, if you do so and really approach this from uh, work and well being and, and resiliency and you know, the health of, of those you're serving, rather than just saying this is in the long term just gonna be a tobacco uh, committee. And then the wellness committee can decide, you know, along with leadership that, you know, they want to focus on tobacco and uh, nicotine addiction as a core component of, of that uh, committee. And, and it's a great way to then identify, recruit, train, and deploy um, your, your human capital. And so really looking at identifying the, the uh, really rich skill sets that the variety of employees and staff and um, the peers that you have possess and combining those in a complementary fashion that's going to get you where you're going and build, really importantly, build a pipeline of wellness champions over time. So this isn't just a, you know, a, a fading proposition where you start it up and then it fades away six months later. And the leadership has to make that really clear too, um, is that this isn't the flavor of the month. People have, the staff and employees have so much coming at them all the time. And a lot of times it's just kind of the wait and see attitude that here's another initiative and let's just kind of wait it out and see if this one disappears two, three months down the line. And the leadership has to make it really clear from the get-go that, that this is not the case, is that we are uh, really um, dedicated to hope the whole health needs of our employees, staff, and those we serve, and this is not going away. And we want to uh, maintain and develop a, a pipeline, and we're going to do that through a, a wellness committee type of structure. And so who, who uh, ideally is on a wellness committee? What is the composition that makes sense? Well, we, we again, had a lot of experience with this and, and we're just putting up some of the uh, individuals and skill sets that are, are, are really um, amenable and help uh, you know, complement each other on a wellness committee. Some of these are really obvious, others might not be as obvious to you. So it's obviously the provider groups, the clinicians, so you want your clinical director on board. Uh, your medical director on board, those, those two uh, positions might have very different perspectives on this. And so it's important to have the, the prescribers as well as the, the clinicians, if you have clinicians on your team involved in this. Security is going to factor in. Um, some agencies have that, some don't. Um, you know, your HR department and whoever's communicating out externally, so public affairs, whoever's doing the health education component, um, you know, just going back to HR, that's just the key because they're, they're going to be the, um, the group or the individuals that really um, sustain the, uh, 
the enforcement piece of this. Um, key client groups are incredibly important um, to have that client voice or that peer voice or that patient voice or inmate voice on your on your uh, on your team. And then very importantly, a few that that folks um, often when we're working with them, the agencies don't think of are neighbors. And by that we mean um, those directly impacted by, if you go tobacco free and people are wandering on someone else's property, maybe that's the business next door and you're in the business sector, maybe that's neighbors, or you're in a neighborhood and that's neighbors. And so we really encourage you to invite those, um, those individuals or those businesses or those eight other agencies that might be intimately affected uh, by your policy into the mix really early and let them know what's going on. And then opponents, and we, and we say that because you really want, ideally you want smokers or nicotine users and people that really are questioning what you're doing on this committee. I mean, they have a really important perspective to, to bring to the mix. And what we find um, often, I mean, really often, honestly, is that um, sometimes the biggest opponents become the biggest champions over time for, for uh, policy initiatives, if they're invited early to really voice why they are, um, what their concerns are up front, um, and, and then go from there. And as I mentioned, the peer voice is just essential. So um, we've talked throughout uh, the, this uh, community of practice about peers, uh, for instance, about having uh, people with a lived experience of being in the justice system, whether they're actively inmates or they're, you know, are now uh, are, uh, out in the community and integrated back into the community. But that voice is so essential as having people with a lived experience, whether it's people with, uh, behavioral health backgrounds or, or backgrounds of being homeless or really being living in poverty. Um, to have those individuals on your wellness team is uh, is essential. And we put this toolkit up here because it's just really, this is for organizations, it's not to train peers, but this this toolkit is to help agencies think and organizations think through the various factors that they need to think through if they're bringing peers onto a team. And uh, so that's things like um, just how you integrate peers on the team. What are the kind of scope of practice and boundary issues that might come up and things of that nature. And so uh, please, if you haven't taken a look at this, this is just another nice resource uh, that is available to you to take a look at. So let's continue on with the, the practices. And now, once you are headed down this road, you have your wellness committee, you really want to create your change plan. And although, um, you know, people throw around the, the term logic model, uh, logic models are really important. And they uh, are a dynamic living document that's, uh, and we really encourage you to, to, to schematically create a figure, a logic model that really starts at the end of the logic model. And at the end of the logic model are what are your distal outcomes that you're looking for? What are your ultimate aims? And then what are your proximal or short-term aims? And then start there and then, um, then you move into the activities that are gonna, going to support those um, aims over time. And then what, uh, you know, what are the resources that are going to be needed to, to affect those activities and what are the human capital issues you're going to have to address. Um, and that's, you know, along with that, that's going to allow you to build a timeline around your initiative. And typically tobacco, nicotine free you know, policy initiatives are, uh, you know, on the very, very short end. Um, they can be six months, but, you know, typically they're about a year long process. And so again, in the toolkit, there's absolutely no need to reinvent a timeline. Um, there's lots of timelines out there, uh, draft timelines and templates that exist, and we provide some of those in our toolkit, but there's others out there as well. Um, and then also, as part of that, looking at the human capital, looking at any kind of budget issues that you're going to face. So that might, something that comes up, it will come up, um, because it always does, is, uh, you know, really uh, looking at, are you going to provide uh, 
cessation medications like nicotine replacement therapy patches, lozenges, et cetera. Uh, and, and if so, how are you going to sustain that cost over time? Are you going to take on that cost? Um, what is the, the cost of, of signage that you might put up? Things of that nature. So you really want to know those factors early on and not be surprised by them. And again, there's a list of these different uh, costs that typically come up in, in the toolkit that we provide. Next, we get into, uh, you know, and I, I'm not going to belabor the five A's because we, we that's been part of our series. We've talked about the ask, advise, assess, assist, range model. Um, but this is very much uh, part of policy too. And so it's essential to integrate cessation services uh, into your uh, nicotine uh, free policy and, uh, and some, some kind of mix of cessation services, uh, definitely for those that are being served, but also looking at that parallel process of, about what uh, services are open to um, staff, employees, providers, as well, um, and you know, we don't really, we don't need to get in the weeds on this on these uh, on the five A's uh, because there's been you know we've done these other trainings, but also we have some really nice resources um, that uh, you can go to that that really detail um, these different aspects of what you need to do as, as far as each one of those components in time. But really what we're getting at, and this is, was another um, core piece of one of our webinar series, is talking about um, co-treatment models and medica medication-assisted treatment are MAT for tobacco. And so this is, again, the combination of behavioral interventions and medications, which is highly effective for op opioids, alcohol, but it is ex exactly the same thing that we're talking about when it comes to tobacco dependence. And so um, you will see in, in the, in the uh, policy types of examples that we have that this is written in as part of the policy that some, um, some combination of treatments is going to be provided whether that's in-house or whether that's through a very strong referral source. Uh, because again, if these, if you have a policy in place and you're not providing any kind of uh, cessation services, um, if you don't have either of, the, of those pieces, um, your initiatives are really going to falter. And so, and this is just, again, you've seen this before, but just again, making it clear that we don't need to get into all the details because these evidence-based uh, guidance exists in the, the form of the toolkits that we've put together and a variety of other resources out there that are available to you. But we really tried to give the basics about MAT and about the five A's in our, uh, our prime tobacco-free toolkit for healthcare providers. And again, it says healthcare providers, but really this crosses the, it's very generalizable. So it, it crosses the boundaries into public health, into criminal justice, et cetera. And then we've created these supplements specifically for these health disparity populations like the justice involved population. And then you'll, you can go down and get these supplements for any one of these different disparity groups and uh, make sure that your uh, community partners are apprised of, of these resources as well. And the thing with, as we go down, because again, you know, there, there is a very real concern that if you go down this path as part of your policy and you're saying, we're going to do the five A's and we're going to provide some, um, some degree of cessation services on site. Um, you know, Jim in one of his presentations made the point uh, of if everyone referred out, you know, which we should do the quit line for sure. But if everyone referred out, who's actually doing the treatment? And so we, we all have some skin in the game of providing some level of treatment and cessation services uh, based on our, our resources. And I mean, I, we understand it's very resource dependent. But what this flow chart is showing you is, is that often, the, uh, really, the reality of the services that need to be provided 
um, on site in an agency is a lot lower than people think. So uh, we really do want to ask 100% of individuals that are in the system are, are being served if they're smoking and we want to respond accordingly. And so out of that, say in the criminal justice system, they might smoke at a, a rate of you know, 70%, which is you know, extremely high, again, compared to the, the general population. If you look at the staff, um, the staff might smoke or use nicotine products at a rate of 30%, which is again, about double the rate of the general population. So again, very high. But you want to then for that 70%, if they're your client base or your patient base or your, you know, your inmate base, advise those individuals accordingly about quitting. Um, if you assess then where for those folks that are, are ready for some degree of intervention and you assess their level of dependency, you know, about about a little more than half of those individuals might really have a nicotine dependency that you need to act on. And then if you break that down into how high is that dependency level, uh, you know, about 22% of that, um, that number is gonna have a really high dependency level. 17% um, are gonna be somewhere in the middle, 5% are somewhat low. Um, and the, you know these are back of the envelope types of um, calculations that are being done but you know based on the literature that we read all the time they're, they're pretty right on so really what we're getting at is that when you get down to it it's that 22 percent that you're really going to have to provide and maybe that middle percent the 17 percent but as far as some kind of um, the intensity any kind of high intensity mat type of treatment um, you're really going to be targeting that high dependency group. So it's not as many people as you might expect and not as high a burden from a financial sense or a you know, human capital sense as you might suspect going into this. And then as we move on and look at, um, and just kind of put two of these things, uh, a few of these things together too. We we're talking about communication, but it's just really important again to start communication from the beginning of the planning process. So this comes from leadership to start with, and really putting pushing this out um, to staff, uh, to employees, to the the client base, but also to the community partners that this is coming. This is very real. We've made this. We are dedicated to moving forward. We're going to carry through with this entire. Uh, initiative and we're going to communicate and we're going to share with you and be transparent throughout the process about what we're at, why we're doing it, why we value this and why it's mission consistent and really connect the policies back to those values and importantly along the way elicit this input and feedback and so we highly recommend that throughout this process that and, and early on that you have uh, forums in these agencies uh, for uh, really soliciting um, the concerns. I mean, it can be some, some individuals will be, you know, the, I call them the silent majority are gonna be in favor of these initiatives. That's what we find all the time. But there's gonna be the very kind of outspoken few um, that have real, real concerns. And, and some of these are very reasonable and some aren't, but really providing a, a, a forum for that um, kind of input uh, really goes a long way to um, pushing down any long-term um, uh, long-term struggles you have with with uh, implementing a policy, because it, even if individuals know that the, the change is coming, it's going to happen. At least they have their say, and you know they might have some very reasonable um, recommendations for how to make the policy better. And, and so um, we highly recommend that uh, those forums happen both on the, the staff side, um, but also on the, the client and the patient or inmate or you know, whatever group you're working with on that side as well. But then again, the, that communicate leadership's commitment, regardless of the, because often leadership will hear a few you know, negatives from very loud voices. And we've seen this happen, unfortunately, where a very strong initiative was headed forward, a, str a few strong voices came and said, you know, you definitely can't do this for, th for these reasons, uh, we don't want this to happen, and then leadership backed off. 
Um, and that's unfortunate because we found that when leadership doesn't back off and says, well, we want to hear where you're coming from, but we're going to do this. This is why um, the policy will be effective. So utilize the multiple voices and perspectives, get those voices out, both in the, with, amongst your community partners, but also internally on an ongoing basis. Now let's look at too, in just providing education, you know, for your staff internally, really making it clear uh, about that connection between uh, behavioral health or other issues, whether it's other addictions, uh, whether it's other, um, you know, other issues like uh, recidivism that intersect with nicotine addiction and providing education about that. And, making it very clear that there's there's uh, ways to, if people use the evidence-based practices that uh, Matt is consistent with Matt, that they have a really good probability of being successful with their quit attempts. Um, and then sharing some brief screening and assessment tools and, and working with uh, staff about, you know, their treatment and discharge planning and how to integrate um, nicotine um, nicotine cessation into that and also talking about priority populations and some of the challenges that they face um, and that are really unique um, or sometimes they're unique sometimes they're not but it's important to kind of hit on those and then uh, talking about the community referrals that exist so quit lines like well like the ash line and how can we utilize these resources that we know work or uh, sometimes extremely underutilized, um, like the quit lines, but once people use them, they can be incredibly effective as well. And so why are we doing all this? And we're offering the cessation support and the education because we, this is what we know from the, from the, the literature is that um, really staff who use tobacco are more likely to feel that patients should not be forced go smoke-free during their stay. They're more likely to attribute patient aggression to the smoke-free policy. They're more pessimistic about patients' ability to succeed. They're less likely to believe that providing nicotine dependence treatment was as important as other uh, caregiving roles they have. They're less likely to agree that uh, patient-client health had improved under the policy, and they're less likely to agree that their own health had improved. Uh, but if you provide the education across time and the cessation services, you really see a reversal across all these different uh, bullets that I just put up, and you see almost the exact opposite. Um, and you see this time and time again. We saw it initially in psychiatric uh, inpatient units, uh, where you know people expected the you know mass chaos when uh, they went tobacco free, um, and they saw that the opposite, where really uh, seclusion restraint almost went to zero in a lot of these environments, uh, behavioral incidents decreased dramatically, and, and it's because people weren't fighting about cigarettes and cigarette breaks and and so forth, and the staff were more satisfied because they were able to do their jobs. And plus, they were also, in the long run, they were satisfied that they were getting their own um, cessation needs met as well, and were able to, to, uh, to quit over time and had that opportunity along with the individuals that they were serving. So then you draft your policy as a piece of this, and it's really important, again, that the, the templates exist in, in our toolkit, um, they're, they're, they're pretty complete. Um, you might have to tailor this a little bit to your environment, um, but it, it really wouldn't be that much. But the, the key is they have to be compre comprehensive. They have to cover all types of employees, staff, contractors, interns, fellows, volunteers, and then cover all types of products. So we went over that, and really trying to be future oriented about what we think is coming in the future. And they have to be complete. So not only comprehensive, but complete. And cover all grounds, cover all sites and divisions, cover all times. I mean, what we some of the mistakes we made, we've seen individuals make, is that they have an indoor policy, but not an outdoor policy. Or if they have an outdoor policy, they have a, a smoking section or a smoking kiosk. And those policies are much more likely to, to fail over time. And you're really taking a staged approach that's unnecessary. And you're really prolonging a process that you don't need to prolong. 
And so this is just uh, an example of as you as you uh, write your policy or help those agencies and partners in the community write their policies. This is just model some model language around ends and other uh, vaping devices. Um, and but the, the the gist of it is you want to make sure that you're covering all nicotine delivery devices, tobacco delivery devices, um, excluding uh, FDA approved nicotine replacement therapy. So unless it's FDA approved, um, it should be used under a policy. Those are the most effective policies out there, the strongest policies. And then you want to launch your policy. And so that's, you know, having a practice day. We found that often if you have a practice day for, for, before you actually launch the policy and and just pretend like the policy went into effect. It's really uh, interesting that people uh, uh, learn really quickly that there weren't a lot of behavioral incidents, that it really went really smoothly, and it really uh, taps down any kind of uh, anxiety that the staff and the leadership have when you actually go live. And then you have your pre-launch reminders, and it's extremely important that you celebrate along the way all the stages. Um, so celebrating your, your launch day and making it a big event and, and doing it everything you can to really uh, bring attention to, to the really uh, amazing policy moves that you're putting into place. And then enforcement, this, this always comes up and this is what people are really concerned about. But what we found uh, across time is that it's never as bad as you think um, and it gets better over time. There might be a few uh, individuals, and it's typically staff, it's not the patients, it's not the clients, it's not the inmates, et cetera, it's the staff that are gonna push um, the envelope a little bit when it comes to new policy change. Uh, and you, you know, and that's where, uh, where the, uh, some kind of progressive uh, response to that needs to be sustained. And for the staff that goes through HR and through patients, clients, inmates, et cetera, that goes to uh, clinical staff or supervisors, et cetera. Um, and there's typically is a honeymoon phase for a few weeks where the, the enforcement is fairly easy. And then people start testing the water. And so this is just normal behavior change and being human. <laughs> and so we very much see this in the nicotine uh, free uh, policy realm as well. Uh, but if you are consistent and you are consistent with your policy, you will see this get better over time because people realize, again, it's not going away. Um, there, there's going to be very clear enforcement strategies in place. You're going to develop scripts. Um, no one likes to be the police unless you are the security folks. Um, but re really, we work with folks to develop scripts about how you positively engage individuals that might be breaking policy and, uh, and, and just inform them in a, in a very friendly manner that uh, you know, it's everyone's job to, to, to let you know that this is a, is a nicotine-free environment. Um, if, if they push it, it's not your job to escalate it by any means. Um, that, that, again, goes to security, that goes to HR, that goes to supervisors and, and clinical staff. Um, but it's, it's critical to follow through with your disciplinary actions and be con consistent with that. And uh, again, typically both on the client side and, and on the staff side, that's some kind of progressive in, uh, kind of uh, response. Um, typically, you know, one, two, three kind of progressive steps that, that people take. But very few people uh, push it that far. There might be, again, one or two staff I just have no interest in following this type of policy and typically they just leave because they um, don't want to see this change happen. So that's kind of worst case scenario that, that we've seen or there might be one client that is really pushing the envelope on this policy but then again we find that that person is typically pushing the envelope on all sorts of issues and so it's, it's just not this. And then it becomes a clinical issue and uh, but what, you know, what we find too that's really important is that with these enforcement strategies, having this in place, um, sites are not losing their senses. The uh, clients and patients are not going elsewhere. I mean, sometimes, you know, within the, for instance, the criminal justice system, they don't have a choice, 
other places they have a choice, but even in those places where there's competition, they have a choice. If the mission consistency is very clear and the reason why they are doing this uh, from the leadership perspective for the health of these individuals, they, they really tend to get it. And uh, we don't see people migrating to uh, competitors, for instance, um, and census is going down. Actually, we've seen some census uh, rates go up um, when whole health is addressed in this way. But consistency is the key. And it's the single largest factor um, that's really gonna make you successful over time. And total prohibitions outperform any kind of transitional phased in or incomplete one. So we talked a little bit about that. Um, it's easier just to rip off the bandage with these things. Um, and, and that's really going to lead to overall satisfaction with the policy instead of having any kind of stepped approach. Um, because the downside of incremental change um, is that, uh, first of all, a lot of people make investments in transi transitional phases, like they'll put a smoking kiosk out in the, on the grounds and they'll spend money doing that, knowing that they're really gonna be moving towards a, a comprehensive policy. Um, so they're just really unnecessarily prolonging this and uh, in doing so. Uh, and then policies that are inconsistent across different, say, services or different localities within a, the same agency, um, there can be perceptions of favoritism and question the legitimacy legitimacy of the policy. So for instance, um, if you have an ambulatory uh, outpatient type of setting and you say, okay, we're going tobacco free completely, nicotine free completely in this environment, but for the, the, the uh, residential settings or the detox settings or the crisis unit, we're not going to, we're gonna um, kind of tra maybe transition or stage to that change. That That's where we see policies are, um, excuse me, problems pop up. Because that again is this inconsistency where people really trade notes and say, well, why do they have to do this? And or we have to do this and they don't and then so forth. And so you really just wanna be consistent across all of these different environments in an agency. And if you are, uh, you know, if you go in this direction, again, what we find is that patients and staff are more favorable in their attitudes after a, tr a transition is complete anyways. Um, and then if you look at the bottom, what we're finding too is that if you really, some of those major concerns are about uh, aggression, et cetera, uh, behavioral incidents. And if, uh, if you go to absolute, you're gonna have much less of that than if you do a tobacco-free transition or clinical or nicotine-free transition over time. You're just gonna get bigger, better outcomes much quicker. And then lastly, the last step is just make sure you evaluate your program over time. So as part of your logic model, when you have your ultimate aims and proximal aims and um, distal aims and, and activities and process variables, really incorporate that into your early planning so that you can look at change over time and incorporate um, rapid improvement programming through plan, do, study, act cycles. Um, and use those uh, effectively if there are any issues that, that are popping up. But you really want to prove uh, you know, over time that your initiative worked. And so evaluating is a, a key of that. And so ending, really what, if we look at the five principles for sustainable change, we mentioned being consistent from a leadership perspective, from an enforcement perspective, from an education perspective, from offering um, cessation aids along the way, being very transparent about what you're doing so there's no surprises, having a bi-directionality of feedback, so being very clear uh, in communicating where leadership is coming from, but really expecting to hear feedback back from a variety of voices and trying to integrate that into the initiative, and then building competency in those new skill sets to uh, really make this, this this gel like those uh, learning the five A's and learning how to do cessation medications on site. And then root celebrating across time is, is key as well. And these are two resources again that we really highly re recommend, you know, outside of the, the resources I mentioned that there's a lot of resources at the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center. 
And then again, if you haven't joined and looked at all of the resources at the National Behavioral Health Network for Tobacco and Cancer Control, please do so because there is lots there to see. And this is us. So I'm going to turn it over to, we have a few minutes if there's some questions and I'm going to turn it back over to Jim at this point. Yeah, thank you very much, Chad. That was, uh, of course, great. Um, uh, deeply informative, I, I, at least I hope so. So yeah, I, uh, we'd like to turn it over to, to you guys now uh, see if you have any uh, questions for, um, for us. And just as a reminder, you can, uh, you can chat in those questions. You can use the Q&A box. I think that might be, in some cases, the, the easiest way. Or you can raise your hand, and then we'll uh, figure out how to get you unmuted so that you can ask your questions with your, with your voice and your microphone. Well, I don't want to uh, belabor the point. I don't want to uh, keep us on the line any longer than we, we need to. Uh, we do, uh, I do want to remind you that our um, next learning community call is next week, uh, exactly a week from the start of this webinar, so on um, December 12th. And during that uh, learning community call, uh, if at all possible, please bring a representative from the community partner that you identified um, for the next round because it'd be great to be able to see one another using our video cameras and to wave hi to one another and to introduce uh, all of us to each other. Uh, it is our hope that all of you on the line will continue with us uh, for the, the next uh, five months of the, the second round along with your community uh, partners. Uh, they'll be ideally implementing some tobacco cessation services and support some change related to getting uh, tobacco cessation services to our uh, vulnerable communities, particularly the justice involved folks. Uh, and uh, if, we're, if we're doing it right, uh, we'll be developing some really nice partnerships between those community partners and local public health and, and uh, you know, sharing uh, needs and potential resources with one another over the course of the next five months. So getting them involved now will be a, a great first start. This is going to be a pretty uh, low burden effort. We'll be reviewing uh, the high points from today's webinar like we always do and then we'll just move into a, a simple round robin where we talk about who we are and what we hope to get out of the next five months from january to may okay and, so, Jim, and jim okay. you see uh susan was just asking if uh -huh. we'll out an outline for what will happen during that call and we, we can definitely sketch that out as uh, as part of the reminder going out early next week too Absolutely, and and on and just to say, uh, to, uh, you know, we had some people uh, when I was doing the community or the um, the TA calls related to the next round a couple months ago. There was um, you know some concern about sharing contact information and, and whatnot. And uh, for now, uh, our our plan is that we will continue to communicate directly to you guys as sort of the team captains for each of your counties, and uh, you, you would then communicate out to your community partners, but to the extent they want uh, more involvement directly with us, that we are, we, it's more like, they, it's more of an opt-in. We, we would love to have them. We would love to have their contact information directly. Um, and we want to open up that, that direct line from them to us. But if it's more comfortable for you, or if it's more comfortable for them uh, to have you guys as the points of contact, that is totally fine with us. So we'll draft out what that uh, outline will look like. We'll share it out to, to uh, this uh, email distribution list for you guys. And then you can share that as um, as appropriate with your partners. Okay, uh, no other questions coming in. I guess we'll sign off and we'll see you next week. Okay, thank you everyone.